Let's start here with what we know about MS. Quick little summary. So MS affects over 400,000 people in the United States, probably about a million, over a million people worldwide, and more than 15,000 people in this Pacific Northwest region alone. And when MS um, exhibits itself, it typically does so in the form of attacks or relapses. So these are events that can be pretty frightening of uh, neurologic dysfunction that can consist of anything from uh, changing of vision, blurring vision, loss of vision, uh, loss of motor skills, loss of sensation, sometimes loss of bowel or bladder control. Um, so these are all episodes that can occur in MS. And like many autoimmune diseases, MS often affects you know, more than two times as many women as it does men. Um, and it is the most common medical cause of neurologic disability in young adults because uh, it typically presents itself between the ages of, of 20 and 50. Uh, so how is it that people with MS get symptoms? Well, so the normal um, nervous system is capable of um, performing for us to help us move, think, feel, um, because we have these nerves that are very heavily insulated with myelin that allow for lightning speed conduction of electricity down nerves so that our brain can communicate with our body. But when the immune system gets involved and starts to attack that myelin, it can short circuit that electrical impulse that is so perfect uh, so that we get interrupted signals and we get these neurologic symptoms. And you can see this uh, on um, gross specimen, you can actually see these scars on the brain. And when you look at it under the microscope and you're actually staining from myelin, you can see that those areas are blank. They don't have myelin. Those are areas of demyelination. And this translates beautifully on MRI scans that have been really important for our understanding of MS, our diagnosis, our management, and our monitoring. So since 1993, when the first of these disease-modifying therapies became available, I was starting my residency, and um, I, you know there have been 12, 12 new disease-modifying therapies. This is huge progress in a really uh, relatively short period of time, and these treatments have really made a, a tremendous difference in the prognosis and the trajectory of, the, of this. Um, condition. And these treatments are available in the forms of injections that you have to administer yourself, or pills that you can take, thank goodness now we have those, as well as infusions. And the, these treatments are meant to reduce relapses, reduce MRI activity, and slow progression of disability. And we can have some huge successes with um, some of these treatments. We've, I've had patients who've had um, major issues, struggled with their condition, and we've gotten them on the right treatment, and now years later they're doing great and even asking me things like, do I need to still be on this treatment? Mm -hmm. um, and of course we generally say yes. Uh, but you know, and then we have patients in whom we, we don't always hit a home run. So we know that although we have these wonderful treatments, we are not yet at a cure. We still have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. We have a lot of questions that are unanswered. And a lot of those questions are questions that we get over and over and over again in the clinic. So our patients are asking us oftentimes the same kinds of questions. What are the most common questions we're hearing? What causes MS? What kind of MS do I have? Uh, how severe will my MS be? What treatment is the right one for me? And is there any way to repair the damage? Super gritty, real questions that are really important. And this is translational research. So you heard Dr. Ziegler say, you know, bench, to bedside, to bench, and of course from my perspective, it's bedside, to bench, to bedside. Right? So the, the questions that our patients are asking, the questions that we're asking, we need to partner with the right people to answer those questions um, and give the kind of feedback and information that these amazing and brilliant scientists um, need to help fuel their research. Because there, there, you know, there are certain things that we understand um, about the disease because we see it every single day. So it's that communication between the scientists and the clinicians that's so important that's going to get at the questions that mean the most to the people we're trying to help. So let's start with this first question. What causes MS? So this is still one of these elusive, um, stinking questions 
uh, that we are working at. And um, we've got some, some good and interesting information, good data that suggests that there are several factors that could be involved in what causes MS. Maybe it's something in the environment, whether it's vitamin D exposure, some virus you're exposed to, et cetera. Um, but we had a hard time pinpointing one cause. Uh, and definitely, the, uh, we're accumulating more and more and more convincing data that the genetics of this um, condition are really important. So your DNA code, your genetic code, um, that, uh, is, is really what may be driving this, um, the expression of this disease. So Dr. Ziegler is working on this question of whether or not the genome, your individual genetic code, might be what uh, brings out MS in people. So he's studying immune cells from healthy controls, and then also people who have MS, and then examining the entire genetic code and looking for these areas called kind of open areas, or open gaps, and it's those open uh, regions that are the important translational regions. So those are the regions where genes are expressed, and if the, you can compare those regions in people who have MS versus people who don't, and look for those differences, and then see what's being expressed there. Is that going to be the key to why certain people develop MS and certain people don't? And then are there links to the things that we know in terms of environmental exposures that are together important in terms of causing MS? What about what kind of MS do I have? So this is one of the most common questions we get right up front. And we've developed this kind of schema um, that we, we did primarily for the purpose of getting people in clinical trials uh, and making sure that we're studying the same kinds of people in clinical trials, but we've done so and um, we've categorized people as having either relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, or progressive relapsing MS based on their clinical disease activity. So by that we mean how they look to us. How do you look to me? Do, are you the person who has lots of relapses and in between relapses you get better? Or are you the person who no longer has relapses anymore and, st and having just slow progression of neurologic disability? Um, those categories are not enough for us to understand this disease. They really don't tell us. Just because we can say you have relapsing in EMS doesn't tell us what kind of trajectory your disease is going to take. Are you going to have severe disease or mild disease? Or it doesn't tell us what kind of treatment you're going to respond to. And so we're, we're starting to move away from some of these categories that are so artificial and really not very helpful and certainly not very descriptive. Uh, we need to understand what's happening underneath those relapses, what's happening underneath that progression. Um, so what's, what's happening with the immunology there? Uh, let's talk a little bit about normal uh, balance between some of these important players in MS. Uh, we found that in MS we've got these so in normal individuals, we have these Th1 cells that are important in inflammation. So whether you're going to fight infection or clear germs from your body, you know, we've got these Th um, uh, response that is important that we think is pro-inflammatory. And then we've got the Th2 cells which help to calm that down because they're a little anti-inflammatory. And there's this nice balance in normal individuals between these Th1 and Th2 cells. And in MS, we think about MS progression, we think about MS attacks and lesions on the brain as, as being um, an expression of those Th1 pro-inflammatory cells which are not being adequately controlled by the Th2 anti-inflammatory response. And so most of our treatments have been involved in direct, they've been directed at quieting or weakening that Th1 response or strengthening the Th2 response. And what we've learned is that there's actually another player. There's another player here. And there's certainly more players than I'm simplifying here. But so we, we've learned there's a very important player called the Th17 cell. And that this is also a very important pro-inflammatory cell that's involved. So now it's no longer just this balance between Th1 Th2, but we've got this other player to think about. And is any individual's disease who might have relapsing remitting MS, is that disease more driven by the Th1 cell? Or is it driven more by the Th17 cell? So Dr. Estelle Batelli is very interested in studying this Th17 driven MS. And um, it turns out that this Th17 response may be more of a brain involving MS disease versus a spinal cord 
involving disease. And spinal cord uh, disease tends to be more kind of uh, motor involvement. So people who have you know, weakness in their legs, etc., weakness in their arms, um, versus involvement in their brain. And so you can imagine that there's going to be kind of a different, that, that that disease state might look a little bit different clinically. So you might have relapse of remaining MS, but if you have a TH17 driven disease, it might be a little bit different than a TH1 disease. So she's developed a mouse that has MS, whose MS is being driven primarily by TH17 cells. So we have this beautiful opportunity to study what that looks like in an animal, and then we can actually target certain treatments, and is that going to respond differently to certain treatments than in, you know, than the TH1 driven disease? And there are clinical trials actually of agents that are specifically directed against kind of the IL-17 response, and you can imagine, gee, you know, that's going to probably be different or have a different efficacy in different kinds of people. So while we may enroll people with relapsing remitting MS in that study, half of those patients might not respond if they don't have that TH17-driven disease. So this is really, really important work. All right, how severe will my MS be? This is probably what people are asking when they say, what type of MS do I have? So I might be able to give you the answer, well, you have relapsing remitting MS, but I haven't answered this question of how severe might your MS be. Um, Dr. Buckner, has led some really, really important uh, work here in this respect to help us understand, can we predict or understand um, whether you may have more severe disease? Um, and if you do, why do you have more severe disease? So let's stop for a minute to talk a little bit more about these T cells again. So these T cells, which we believe are responsible for um, the expression of MS, undergo regulation. So all our T cells undergo regulation. We've got to have some checks and balances. And these T regulatory cells are kind of like law enforcement cells, right? And they're going to exert their law enforcement on the civilian T effector cells. And just like Dr. Buckner already explained, we kind of know what the healthy controls look like here. So healthy controls are, are generally pretty law-abiding cells. Um, and, but you can look here that the people who have more mild disease, less attacks, less disability, that their immune cells, their T cell subsets, are responding in the same way that healthy controls are to this regulation. So they're good law-abiding cells. And then we've got individuals who have more active disease, um, more relapses, more disability, and look here, they're immune cells are not responding in the same way to regulatory T cells. And so we've actually long thought that maybe there's something wrong with regulatory T cells in MS, and it looks like actually no, that these active patients, it's not that there's something wrong with their regulatory T cells, it's that the, the immune cells are not responsive to the regulation. Now, can we fix that? Can you change that? So Dr. Butner's group did look at what happens with treatment. If you treat uh, with treatments, it looks like that regulation or dis, um, or, or the, the uh, resistance, right, to being <coughs> regulated, your tendency to break the law, is, um, is, is rehabilitated. So these become more law-abiding immune cells, and that's really important because not only have we been able to kind of show, gosh, there may be a different um, profile of these immune cells based on whether you have more severe disease or less severe disease, but also a responsiveness to treatment. All right, so what about which treatment is right for me? So it's hard enough for someone with MS to process that diagnosis. So I had to tell a young lady yesterday, a 30-year-old woman uh, with three children, that she has MS. Um, and that is a very, that's a, that's a hard thing to swallow. And then you look at her and you say, okay, which of these 12 treatments do you want to take? I mean, that's even, it's like, what? Uh, and so usually I get the, well, you're the doctor. And then there's this, well, if I knew which treatment was going to work for you, I would not go through the trouble of talking to you about all 12 of these treatments. But I don't know which of these treatments is going to be the one that's going to work for you. And unfortunately, right now, we have this arduous trial and error process where we only know if a drug works for you if we, guess what, we later find out that it failed. Wow. 
So this is where we are with um, treatment. So um, we're really happy to have these 12 treatments, but we're not there yet, right? So we want to get to a place where we can say, this is the treatment for you. So Dr. Chasabell and his group is looking at signatures, genetic signatures um, of disease. So you can see here, you know, these are kind of different colors of the rainbow that represent the thumbprint for uh, types of disease. We have down here, um, these are people with tuberculosis, and you can see here, advanced disease has a very different looking genetic signature than people who have mild disease, right, or most certainly healthy controls. And this is with just a few drops of blood. So the interesting question is, well then what happens when we treat people? What happens when you look at the influence of drug? Well, he looked at that. So you can show a different signature uh, based on the responsiveness to a drug. And so this genetic signature is changing, or that thumbprint changes according to the responsiveness. So we're doing the same work in MS to develop genetic signatures of people who have MS. And then of course we want to see what happens after you're treated to see if that genetic signature changes. Now right now what we're looking, what we'll need to do is then see if we have successful treatment, what did those early signatures look like way, way, way back when, when they were first started on treatment. So then we're hoping that within days to weeks, we'll be able to tell you, within, you know, when you've started a new treatment, that, oh, that's the treatment for you. Or maybe we'll be able to say, gosh, we need to make a switch. All right, is there any way to repair the damage? This is the new frontier, right? This is, well, this is where we must go. We must go here. We must be able to repair um, um, damage because sometimes we can't get to people soon enough. Sometimes the treatment we, tr we chose up front wasn't good enough. So here we can see a person who, in the first scan, uh, got put on treatment nine months later, look, they have new lesions. So you don't need to be a radiologist to see that these scans look different, and these white areas are those areas of MS, and in this person, this treatment did not work. The treatments that we're going to switch to aren't going to make these, scans, these scars go away. Because once those lesions are there, that's done. All we can do is hope that the next treatment is going to prevent more than that. So it's damage control. Um, what we need to do is find a treatment that's going to make these lesions better. So you can see here in this mouse, in a mouse spinal cord, MRI, such a tiny little spinal cord, you can see uh, an area here that's a lesion of MS. And after treatment with this recombinant um, with this uh, new agent, there is um, less light. So that lesion improved. And under the microscope, that area of spinal cord, actually, all these, bl these uh, uh, black squiggles here, all these black little circles, those are new areas of myelin that are forming new myelinated nerves. So, I mean, that is huge. Uh, so that's in the mouse. We just completed a study of this particular agent for the first time in humans in a phase one uh, study. It was a phase one safety study to make sure that this was going to be unharmful in humans. Uh, the next phase is obviously going to be to see, now that we know it's not harmful, uh, is it actually going to work? And are we going to see the same kind of remyelination? Uh, so that's the, um, this is a list of some of the clinical trials that we have going, and um, it's the, it's your participation in these clinical trials, and it's your participation, whether you rolled up your sleeve to give us some blood or helped us in another way, uh, that gets us to the answers that are, that are really, really important. And when people learn that um, what I do for a living, and that I uh, take care of people who have MS, they often say, gosh, wow. Now that's got to be really difficult. And I'm like, wow, I, you must think that because you don't know what I do every day. I mean, I love my job, and I love my job not only because of the kinds of patients I get to work with, but because of the kinds of scientists I get to work with and the work that we get to do. Because of your contribution, we have hope. We have hope that we're really going to make a big difference. So I, I love what I do because I know that someday we're going to get to the point where we, with a couple drops of blood, we're going to tell you what kind of MS you have, how severe it's going to be, what treatment you should be on, and whether that treatment's going to work for you, and hopefully someday reverse that. So thank you for your attention and your contribution, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the next couple of minutes that I have. Yes? 
when you layer your cross section of an MS brain, perhaps with an Alzheimer brain, is there any connection? So the question is, when you kind of compare what the MRI scan looks like of an MS uh, brain versus the kinds of lesions or scars that we see in Alzheimer's, is there any similarity? No, there is not. There are very distinctly different um, conditions. Yes? There was an article in the Times uh, about, um, and I, 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 don't, I didn't see a connection with Bridge and Mason, but basically rebooting the immune system, um, and it shut down uh, the gentleman's yeah, so, so I'm glad you raised that question. So there was, a, there was an article in the Seattle Times uh, about a study called HALT-MS. Um, and it was a, they referred to it as a stem cell transplant um, uh, study, and it's gotten a lot of attention. And it was a small number of patients who underwent a bone marrow transplant, basically, to potentially reboot their immune system. And there was great success in some of the patients who were enrolled in that study. Uh, we're always excited to know that there can be other techniques and other treatments that are going to be exciting um, and helpful. Uh, that particular study um, uh, is of interest because people hear stem cell and they're like, this is what we want to do. This is what's going to give us the reverse the, the, the scars, etc." cetera. And um, it's important to know that, that that study was using hematopoietic stem cells, which means those are stem cells that are already destined to be immune cells. So we already know that they're going to be immune cells. So that's really all they're ever going to do. And so what, we're, what, what they tried to do in that study was a lot of chemotherapy up front, and then a little sampling of their bone marrow, um, reintroduce these immune cells after it was obliterated, and hope that it will grow back right and won't attack myelin anymore. Um, we can show, actually, similar types of efficacy with some of the other drugs that are FDA approved that may be a little bit less toxic. We are hoping, right, that we don't have to obliterate the entire immune system. With some of the work especially being done here, we're hoping that we can actually get at the target that we need to instead of getting rid of all the good and the bad. As Dr. Buckner already said, you know, getting rid of the good and the bad can be problematic. So I think it's promising because um, it's um, showing us that Targeting that immune system is one part of, it, uh, of success. Um, we're not yet at a place where stem cells that we consider to be pluripotent or stem cells that can ultimately be destined to become anything, nerve cells, right? That's what we really want. We're not at the point where we can take that immature pluripotent cell and just put it in our body and hope that it will know where to go and stimulate what it needs to do and then create myelin. I often liken it to kind of putting 50 kindergartners in the gym, closing the door, and hoping that a society will develop. <laughs> what, we, what, we, what we are doing, like with that last slide that I showed you, was we have all the dendrocyte precursor cells, which means those cells that are so close to being myelin producers. They're so close, but they're just stuck in adolescence. So they've gone through kindergarten, grade school, high school, everything, and they are at that, I know what I'm supposed to be, but I'm just stuck. I'm stuck in arrested development. And so right now, some of the work we're doing is trying to manipulate that moment so we can cause that cell to turn into that myelin producer so it doesn't have to go through that long, 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 long path. Uh, but stem cell research is certainly going to be exciting and interesting because we need to get there. We need to know what to do to, to lead the kindergarten all the way through to uh, many other uh, potential um, target cells. Yes? Sir? Yes? Oh, um, when the drug companies are developing these new drugs, do they drill down to the level of detail that you're at? And if they do, do they share that with you? So do the drug companies drill down to the level that we, that, um, that we do, and do they share that with us when they're doing clinical trials? Um, so yes and no. Uh, so most of the drug companies um, um, have certain endpoints in mind uh, to get their drug to market. And so part of that's going to be proving it can slow relapses down and, um, and uh, reduce the number of new lesions and slow progressions. Um, where some of that dialing down occurs is with partnerships. And so not all, you know, partnerships with clinicians and scientists and drug companies is evil. Uh, there has to be some kind of partnership there where um, they're looking to scientists like those here at BRI to say, listen, can you, 
can you do that work? Because we're doing this other stuff, but can you be the ones to um, really look carefully at whether or not we're looking at a TH17 response, etc. So, so some of the drug companies absolutely have you know, tons and tons of the scientists behind the scene trying to drive some of that work too, but there's also a lot of partnerships that occur um, with those of us um, you know, um, at our various institutions. Yes, sir? Clearly there's a patent issue response from pharmaceutical companies, and does BRI have a similar response? I can comment on that. So I'm going to let Dr. Buckner I'm answer that question. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Well, I always love hearing Rico talk. So I'll just answer a couple questions. I can actually chime in. So we do have relationships with pharmaceuticals where we help them ask those really basic questions. And you're right. You always have to think about intellectual property. And we, in fact, have a group here that helps us think about that. <laughs> because it's important to make sure that we get the best therapies to patients and we want to make sure that that's done through collaborative research agreements as well as being able to move forward. I also wanted to bring up the Holt MS study. I'm glad someone brought that up because um, I read that article too and I think the, the parts of that article that didn't come out is that in fact the um, Immune Tolerance Network is the group that uh, supported that study which was a multi-institutional study. Um, the Immune Tolerances Network is centered here at Benaroya Research Institute and headed by our director, Jerry Nipong. So, uh, in fact, that, that um, study was, was, came out of our institute in terms of its direction. And the samples from that study came here and uh, one of my colleagues, Alice Long, actually analyzed the samples from those, that study. So when we have a study of MS that's a clinical trial and you, and you get the clinical information, we actually send those samples back to us where we can ask the question, well, why did some people get better and some people not? And so that process is going on here at PRI.